Angela, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm so good. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on as your guest. The pleasure is all mine and hopefully for the listeners too, because you have a fascinating story and a whole lot to share. It's just a lot of fun and I can't wait to dig right into it. So yeah, have I know we're going to have fun in this conversation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. And what you do? Well, my name is Angela Lee, and I am a children's author. I write the Bella Santini Chronicles. It's a set of children's books that are designed to really help children know how to deal with emotional things in this world. So bullying or abandonment, these kind of things can scar people and with the tools in my children's books kids might be able to not be scarred <laughs> wow that is fantastic and let's be honest the last few years there's a whole lot that uh has oh, contributed yeah. to that potential for emotional difficulties for kids and for adults is that for right us? i mean if if you have ever been triggered by someone's words or behavior, the tools in my books can help you. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I don't know about other folks, but I learn a lot from reading with my kids. Whenever it's something, quote unquote, I'm using my air quotes here for kids, I generally <laughs> learn a whole lot from it myself. So I have had... um women as old as in their 80s say they learned from my books. And I've had 11-year-old boys put down electronics to have their parents read my books to them. So it's timeless information, and I get this. Absolutely. And we're never too old to learn something new, and we're never too mature to become more mature in our emotions. True. And I like that you're talking about emotional maturity as opposed to control, because the idea that we have to control our emotions leads to repression, which is not good. Absolutely. Well, before we dive into your children's books and all about those, uh, life wasn't always this way for you. You had a different <laughs> life before this. Care to share? <laughs> yeah. So before, <laughs> oh my gosh, um, I'll start at birth, I guess. Yes, because uh, I was born in the mid 60s in San Francisco, and our apartment looked out on Golden Gate Park. So I was witness to the summer of love as a very young child. And I think that those ideas of love, not war, tolerance of individuals were kind of embedded in me at that time and but but even though I had this you know beautiful situation outside my house inside was difficult my father was an alcoholic and he was abusive and it's you know I could tell stories that would raise your hair on and but I don't see the point of that <laughs> because you know hurt people hurt people and so <laughs> the reason he was an alcoholic is that he was trying to escape the feelings of being not enough he had been born a sensitive young man in 1925 and in those days, you know, men were tough and rough and you couldn't have sensitivity. So his father rejected him for his sensitivity and tried to kind of beat it out of him. My father drank to get away from those feelings of inadequacy. 
but his behavior when drunk caused him to be not a good father. So his escape method just perpetrated, just extended his feelings. And the reality is we pass on what we know, good, bad, otherwise. And in absolutely we heal, we're going to keep teaching those traits. So healing ourselves yeah. not only heals ourselves, but also the generations that come from us and after us. Absolutely. I say most parents parent either exactly how their parents did or in the exact opposite way because they were somehow harmed by what their parents did. And both ends of the spectrum are not the ideal um the ideal way for kids to be brought up. I tell parents that the model of emotional coping they teach their children is how their children will grow up and and follow. And so if we can, through my books or whatever other books out there that do it, provide kids with the tools that allow them to truly face and be with their emotions without having the emotions grab hold and grab control, then they have the ability to thrive in life. So how did you learn a new way? <laughs> it's funny because I was on a podcast this morning. They're like, well, you're not a psychologist and you're not you're not a teacher. <laughs> How did that? Well, I say that 54 years of receipt of bullying, whether it was my father or my ex-husband, um, taught me some deep truths about how hurt people hurt people. And I became aware that it is the story of our circumstance that causes the emotion to linger all day. So when we can disconnect our mind from the story of our circumstance and focus only on the feeling, then we actually, the feeling will flow because that story kind of stops. It, it, it causes the feeling to get stuck. I like to say that emotions are energy. They're magnetic energy. And thoughts are energy. They're electro energy. So when you put electromagnetic together, guess what? It's really super sticky. <laughs> so what I teach is to feel, name, and allow an emotion. And it's really about that focus of attention, staying on the emotion so that your mind is so focused on the feeling that it's not thinking, he did that, I don't want to feel this way, and all those other things, stories that keep us wound up in the feeling. Now, did you have a moment when something clicked inside you and said, I don't want more of this. I want a better way. And if so, yeah. you don't have to share the details of that unless you want to. But would you share with us what the difference was in that moment? What was your mindset? What happened internally yeah. to shift that? So I was kind of a professional victim. <laughs> <laughs> victim of my father, victim of my employer, victim of my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And um, this seminal event happened in my life. It was a wildfire in Northern California that destroyed 5,000 homes in my community. And the, well, yeah, and mine. <laughs> <laughs> but the outcome of it was that I went into this dark night of the soul and I started questioning, is this a life that I want to live? I'm miserable in this life. Do I want to keep doing this? So within six months, I left the marriage 
And I quit my government job and then moved across the ocean to England and started writing fairy tales. <laughs> so I don't know how many people can say a wildfire um, changed their life for the better, but I am one who can say that. <laughs> Yeah. And clearly there was an internal shift there that just said, I'm worth more and I'm going to get it. Oh boy. It, that is, yeah. Because I was miserable um, because I had allowed my former husband to be critical of me, to, to, to say and disrespect and do the things that he did. And I never drew a boundary line and said, I'm better than this. I don't, I don't deserve this. And that's because of my childhood in injuries, um, the things that I took away from my relationship with my father. And I realized, I think two months after I left my marriage, that it was the first time I put myself first in my life. Yeah. So tell us about Bella Santini. <laughs> Bella Santini is the main character of my books, the Bella Santini Chronicles. And the story tracks her as she finds out who she really is. Because at the beginning of the story, she is masked. She is glamored to be a human. And as she goes through the different trials and tribulations, um, her story begins to unfold. So by the third book, she knows that she is the crown princess of the Fey world. And there's a whole lot of what goes into that. <laughs> oh, for sure. And don't give away everything that's in your book. Absolutely not. No. But no, it's pretty clear, though, because book one and book two start with Bella Santini. Book three is called Princess Bella. That's so oh, yeah. It's no, many, no secret. Yeah. yeah. How many books are in the series? Well, there's three published. The number four is um, in the process. It, it's like edited and I have the illustrations, so... It's likely that it'll be published by the end of this year. And book five is mm, three quarters written. And I've been saying that for like a year and a half now. <laughs> I got to get it done. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, I was asked this morning, how do you take these big concepts and make them understandable for kids. And I said, you know, it's not that I do any of that. I sit down and the story pops into my head and I write. And so I think the last year and a half has been really about me getting the word out, establishing my brand and making um, sure people understand why it's so important for their kids to know how to deal with emotions. Is it fair to say that Bella Santini is your alter ego? Mm. I knew that question was someday going to be asked. <laughs> yes, she can be an allegory for me <laughs> because as I as I wrote the books, I was discovering who I really am. Um, yeah, it could, it could be. <laughs> or is it fair to say that she is the child you wish you could have been? Mm. I don't think that that's the case. I think it's fair to say that she's every child. Because... You know, what happens in this world is children take in information from parents or teachers or religious leaders and all these influencers. They talk about how the world is. 
but they're talking about how the world is through their life experience and their vision. And so it's not necessarily how the world is. It's how they see the world. And but children don't have the filters to say, I'm going to take that, but not that, because that strikes me as real and that one doesn't. Um, so giving them these tools, including a, an ability to question and look at things and understand, there's a saying in the Talmud, we do not see the world as it is. We see it as we are. And that's a pretty profound statement. But when we apply that to the people who told us how the world is, and we understand that they're only seeing it as they, through the filters and the perceptions that they're looking through, then, you know, their life is, is never going to be the same as our life. And so we don't have to follow that path. We don't have to necessarily take, um, like, my grandfather's or my grandmother's um, idea that you have to save everything because the um, depression happened when she was raising kids. And, and you know, in her mind, you you had to hold on to everything because it's going to go away. And that is a role model, a world model. I don't have to keep. And one of the more nuanced and difficult aspects of parenting in, in my experience and in my opinion is helping kids find their own eyesight or their own way mm -hmm. to view the world, but also to give texture to it to give understanding to it vocabulary and flexibility that okay i see the world but the world is changeable my understanding is changeable uh there's a flexibility there but also balancing flexibility with foundations and <laughs> they're so it's new not an easy <laughs> yeah um so telling our children that they always have choice is a huge lesson because the reality is in the world, we do always have choice. When I was in that toxic marriage and being screamed at by my husband, I had the choice to get up and leave. I had the choice to stay there and I chose to stay there because I could not, well, I was so entrenched in putting other people first that I did not wish to hurt him and me leaving would hurt him. So I thought that wasn't even a choice. It wasn't an option. And how many of us hold ourselves back from what we really want because we have these false options or false choices we think this isn't a choice when it really is. And often not choosing is a choice. <laughs> it's totally a choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because kids have access to so much information and so much influence. It's not just mm -hmm. information they have access to, but it's people's influence on that information that is particularly uh problematic concerning <laughs> let's just say and yeah having the uh the tools to understand for oneself well they said it but it doesn't mean it's necessarily true does it pass my internal filters of values of what i experience in this world and what i know to be true and having people that they have identified as safe people that will tell them the truth and give them the space truth. to find their own truth. I mean, Ooh. goodness gracious, <laughs> we're in this postmodern world where everything is defined and understood by one's perspective. Teaching a yeah. child to have a perspective 
to recognize and honor the perspectives of others, but then to ultimately choose one's own. That's a rough mm. task. It's a, um, that is a gift that we can give our children. And the way I see it is if you start young and you offer them the opportunity to choose, it's, it's, you know, nine o'clock bedtime. Do you want to read a book for 10 minutes or do you want to talk for 10 minutes? The nine o'clock bedtime is non-negotiable, but how the next 10 minutes is negotiable and they have a choice. And so giving them the opportunity to choose is a powerful thing that helps them come to a inner knowing that this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And self-awareness is a huge aspect of that. When we know who we are, what we want, what our desires are, then we can really um, go out in the world and try to achieve that. And giving our kids the space to ask the questions, to try out mm. different points of view, to try out Absolutely. different emotions. That's yeah. Huge. And as a parent, don't, a parent may fear if a child is exploring a different idea. Like, well, my son was reading these big, thick books on um, hallucinogenic drugs. It was, totally afraid of where he was going to go with that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he did explore. And um, fortunately, he decided that those weren't the avenue for him. So I understand that there can be an undercurrent of fear if a child is exploring an area where you don't want them to go into. But you know, there's the old question of like, what's the purpose of life? <laughs> and I, in my um, experience and my learnings, I've come to the understanding that the purpose of life is, is to experience. Our souls come to this earth to be born, to experience. And souls do not quantify good or bad. So being abused as a child is an experience for the soul to gain some un deeper understandings and some learning. And so um, for a parent, it's almost like, okay, who is this child? Is this child strong enough in their inner core that I can trust them to explore this arena without making poor dis decisions? And even having the curiosity to ask the kind of questions like, are you willing to talk to me before you make any decisions about this? Okay. Um, are you willing to have a discussion about this? can can help set the stage for the child to explore without making those four decisions. For whomever's interested, and I know it's going to be a lot of people that are listening, there's a link in the show notes to the Bella Santini book, so I encourage you to check them out. Again, they're not just for kids. Uh, it might be your excuse to buy them, but there's information there that's helpful for everyone. Angela, what would you like to leave us with today? What parting thoughts or encouragement would you like to share? I would like to say that, um, you know, one of the things that I always say is give yourself grace. We live in a world where nobody taught us about emotions. We weren't told that they're not negative or positive. They're just feelings. And it's our reaction to them that can bring on negative or positive. And 
we haven't been told that there are these really great tools out there that you can use to get through those feelings like breath work or EFT tapping, or there's just this whole variety of emotional management tools. And we don't have to run away from a feeling. In fact, that repression or pushing away a feeling is going to come back and harm you in the long run. So it's really better to learn how to face your feeling. Beautifully said. Thank you, Angela. Oh, thank you.